Good afternoon, I am Vikas. I teach at Azim Premji University and I am pleased to have Dr. Srinath Raghavan with us. Srinath is a professor of international relations and history at Ashoka University and more importantly, he is the author of several interesting books, most recently The Most Dangerous Place and History of the United States in South Asia. South Asia and the making of modern South Asia, a global history of creation of Bangladesh and war and peace in modern India. Uh, so, welcome Srinath. Thank you. Uh, so, we are going to discuss some of his, you know, work and try to understand the strategic uh, 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 calculus of India in light of his work. One thing that most of us find interesting is that uh, Governments right from the beginning had this notion of India as a special country. Now, different governments have praised it in different ways. For instance, the contemporary, the the, the present government claims that India is a special guru, but but one or the other, other formulation has always been at the back of the you know, mind of policy makers. How has this belief? in India's special position in the world without a comparable, uh, you know, material support base, how has that affected a foreign policy? No, you're absolutely right. I think from the very beginning, in fact, you could say that even before independence, if you go back to uh, the statements and resolutions which were made by people associated with the nationalist movement, you will find that there is a sense that India has something special to offer to the world that Indian nationalism is uh, a, an experiment in holding together a very large, diverse country and that in some ways India's uh, sort of struggle against colonialism is at the sort of leading the arc uh, of decolonization across the world and so on. So from the very beginning there was this sense of, I hesitate to use the word exceptionalism because that has a very peculiar sort of relationship with the United States, uh, but a sense that uh, this is a country uh, which was destined to play a very important role uh, on the international stage. Uh, and, and from the very beginning in some ways, you could say that uh, the dichotomy between uh, this kind of a conception of India's exceptional role uh, and importance in the international stage uh, stood in stark contrast with its, uh, you know, uh, very sort of poor, underdeveloped, militarily weak situation, even coming out of colonialism. And uh, for someone like Jawaharlal Nehru, I think the challenge really was how do you compensate for this kind of material weakness and still play an important role? Uh, but the period of decolonization across the world offered India an opportunity to uh, play that kind of a leadership role. And uh, which is why if you notice, you know, in some ways, uh, Nehru's India was economically perhaps the weakest, uh, you know, because we came out of a long period of colonialism, you know, our own economic development had just about started uh, getting going. But that was also the period when India was the most activist in uh, on the international stage, right? I mean, already in 1946, there is an Indian delegation in the United Nations yeah. General Assembly talking about South Africa's plans for, you know, separate laws for uh, people of Indian origin, etc., which is a precursor of the kind of system that would harden into an apartheid uh, kind of a situation. India is very active in the sort of, you know, question of independence of, say, Indonesia and, and the Dutch colonization. We play a very important role in uh, the Korean War, uh, and not very effectively, but nevertheless we are there. Mm -hmm. We play a very important role in the context of Indochina. We are active in the various kinds of Taiwan Straits crises. So this was a period where, because of the particular global context uh, and an astute understanding of what that allowed us to do, we managed to play an important role. But again, I would say that the uh, fact that we played a role also has to be judged against what kind of outcomes and uh, you know consequences that we managed to secure and I think there the record is rather more mixed. Uh, I think the activism did not always have the kind of benefits that uh, you know Indian leaders particularly Jawaharlal Nehru and others hoped it would but nevertheless it was there and you're right to say that you know that has been a long-standing sort of trend which is that uh, which is why even now right I mean if you look at uh, under the current government I mean talk of Vishwaguru, etc., you know, is, is kind of often, uh, you know, people lampoon it, saying, you know, it's a particular kind of way of positioning yourself. But if you look at the more brass tacks of the way policy making is work, I think India has once again realized the importance of the global south. You know, mm. that's a kind of vocabulary which had fallen out of use, you know, because for a long time we wanted to tell people that we are not non-aligned, right? I mean, the, using the word non-aligned itself was seen as sending up a red flag of a certain variety. Uh, because we wanted to show that we are actually getting closer to the United States and the United States wanted 
not strategic autonomy, but strategic alignment. Even very recently, uh, the American ambassador to India said that you know mm. there is no strategic autonomy in wartime and so on, right? So that that kind of framing always is very problematic. And there was a period when improving relations with the United States and the West was seen as a great priority, both for economic, geopolitical, and other reasons. So some of this discourse was kept uh, on the back burner. Uh, about 10 odd years ago, uh, a group of us wrote a report called Non-Alignment 2.0, mm -hmm. Foreign Policy for yes. India. And uh, you know that report was criticized principally for the title rather than for the content. Yes. But, uh, but I think now, you know, the tables uh, or whatever, you know, the wheel has turned again and now Global South is back on the agenda, partly because of uh, issues like climate change, mm -hmm. partly because of the Ukraine war and the way that, you know, that has kind of been uh, parsed. And I think India has realized that we do have some resources, both intellectual, political, historical, that we should be capitalizing on. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, we are, it will be a long time before we are going to be like a traditional great power. Sure. Because, uh, you know, one of the sort of dichotomies for a country like India, even in present day context, let alone in the past, uh, and I would say to some extent China, but India more so, mm -hmm. is that, you know, in aggregate terms, now we are large, right? We are a large economy, we are a large military, uh, so the world expects us to sort of play a role which is commensurate to our size. But in every per capita term, we are still a developing country in, in some indicators, perhaps, you know, even uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom of the scale. So this dichotomy, between the fact that the world expects us to play a bigger role, but our own developmental constraints, etc., have their own play, is an enduring tension, I think. And that yes. tension will remain. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Yes. I mean, even if we become a developed country by 2047, as the Prime Minister wants us, unlikely to go away. So, now coming, moving from there to the next decade, uh, where, you know, uh, so be one of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, you know, ways in which people that the success of Peruvian foreign policy is whether his activism, international activism, helped him to deal with the Chinese threat. Now, uh, it seems that it did not help much. Uh, and, and I'd like to bring up a very important you know, uh, uh, development around the Chinese war, which you discuss in your work, is about India's decision to procure make 21 fighter jets from Russia. Now, um, uh, the, the the Indian the Indian government uh, assumed at that time that by purchasing these MiG fighter uh, from planes from USSR, they are both purchasing uh, the the neutrality of Soviet Union, which is close to China, but and also equipment at cheaper rates compared to the Western equipment. And there was also an understanding that the Soviet, uh, you know, uh, machines would be easier to reassemble in India later on because we, we had this plan of of building an, uh, a production facility in India as well. It was thought that the American machines are technically too advanced and it would be a bit difficult to you know, manufacture them here. Uh, now we know that in the just a week before the Chinese before China declared the hostilities, I mean, attacked India, uh, Soviet Union informed China that it is delaying the delivery of the, the planes, uh, MiG-21 fighter jets. Now, and and but but it did not inform India until the end. Uh, do you think that the fact that the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet leaders, told China that they are Delaying the delivery, did that you know play a role in Chinese uh, your calculus to uh, attack o o o you know open hostilities? Because a lot of us continue to ask, would the timely delivery of MiG-21 would that have made a difference at all? Hmm. So I'd like to know your views on no, this. That's an interesting and a controversial question, even in historical terms, right? So let's take a step back first and say that from about 1960, right? which is the time when the Sino-Indian boundary dispute actually becomes a hot potato. Yes. Till then, the government is trying to kind of keeping it under wraps in 1959. There are clashes which happen. Hmm. Uh, by April 1960, when Chow and Lai, Premier, Premier Chow and Lai of China comes to India for five days, there are very long negotiations, nothing comes out of hmm. it. You know, there is a bureaucratic exercise on sort of officials looking at records, etc., which has begun. And then the situation on the ground continues to get more and more tense. Right? So, so you could say that that is the inflection point, which is early 1960. Now, early 1960 is also a period when 
the Sino-Soviet relationship, the relationship between the Soviet Union and China is also going down the tube. Yes. Um, because what is happening is an ideological and power struggle between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, the Chinese were, uh, you know, happy to sort of play the role of a subordinate ally to the Soviet Union from 1949 onwards. The Soviet Union in turn was helping them tremendously, particularly with their economic development. I mean, today's China is inconceivable without the Soviet Union. Yes. It's a historical irony, but the industrialization of an predominantly peasant society was done by Soviet technicians in the 1950s in a very big way, right? But all those technicians actually pulled out in 1960 hmm. because the uh, Khrushchev and Mao Zedong effectively fall out. Hmm. In fact, Nikita Khrushchev in one of the uh, meetings of the Soviet sort of, uh, you know, presidium says that Sino-Soviet relations can only improve if Mao Zedong undergoes a brain surgery, right? He says this guy is nuts. So the relationship is actually pretty bad. And India, Jawaharlal Nehru realizes that, and he, in some ways he has always believed that the Sino-Soviet relationship will have some frictions and that communism is not going to be enough to bind these two countries together. He believes that Chinese nationalism is a very powerful force and that figures like Mao Zedong are not only important for their communist ideology, but for their sort of nationalism and so on. So Nehru therefore believes that, you know, there is a moment where there is a gap which is, a, which is widening between the Soviet Union and China and that this will work to India's benefit. And you see that actually that does happen. In a sense, the Soviet Union takes a slightly sort of standoffish position. In fact, the Chinese do not appreciate it at all. Yes. The Chinese are constantly telling the Soviet Union that you are letting down a socialist country yes. and you are actually supporting a country which is a lapdog of imperialism, etc., etc., which is India, right, because of its closer ties with the British Commonwealth and other things. Uh, so there is a, therefore, you're absolutely right that in some ways, Nehru believed and the Indian system as a whole, I think, believed at that point of time that China would be more restrained in dealing with these kinds of boundary issues. They may be localized clashes, but they will not do anything much more than that because, you know, a, a larger war might then involve the superpowers, etc., in a different way. And that, that is not something that the Chinese would want. Uh, I think what Nehru had underestimated in the context of the Sino-Soviet relationship at that time is the strength of the ideological sort of dimension to that relationship. Because, you know, the Chinese decide around May 1962 that they will have to prepare to launch a major attack on India. And that preparation is actually entrusted to Deng Xiaoping, who later becomes a, you know, a very important leader mm. in China. Uh, but that does not mean a final decision is taken. Preparations are uh, made underway. Uh, and the Chinese, uh, you know, just literally days before, you know, uh, an attack is going to unfold, they sound out in the Soviet Union to say that, listen, I mean, the Indians are being extremely unreasonable. We have tried our best to resolve this thing. But that this looks like it may be something. So it's 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 literally sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're sending up a balloon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're actually quite surprised by the Soviet reaction, which mm -hmm. is that Khrushchev says, listen, uh, you know, as a, you know, Marxist-Leninist, I believe that, you know, our solidarity towards a communist country is extremely important. China is a brother, India is a friend. Mm -hmm. And that in a situation like this, you know, we'll obviously always stand by our brothers, but still we hope Indians will see reason and so on. And uh, it's at that time that this communication is made. Uh, that this thing. Now, the Indian decision to buy the MiGs, you're absolutely right, was in some ways uh, aimed at both cementing the relationship with the Soviet Union, but they also believed that uh, you would get more out of that relationship in terms of defense technology mm -hmm. for the reasons you've outlined, which is licensed production mm -hmm. of uh, you know these things. Uh, actually, at that point of time, the Americans and the uh, British made a quite a strenuous effort to convince Nehru, uh, you know, Kennedy and Macmillan uh, tried to convince Nehru that you know he should not sort of you know, embark on that kind of a relationship with the Soviet Union. Uh, but that happened. And uh, then, of course, once the war broke out, it so happened that that coincided exactly with the Cuban Missile Crisis as well, right? At which point of time, the Soviet Union now felt that it needed the support of all the socialist countries because it was up against the United States in what looked like it could become a shooting war pretty soon. Uh, so during the course of the 1962 sort of Sino-Indian conflict, you see that the Soviet Union is actually taking a much more pro-China stance, uh, even more than what they're sharing intelligence with the Chinese. They're doing various kinds of things. Uh, but then, of course, uh, you know, a month after the war is over, Khrushchev once again uh, does a U-turn. And this is, again, partly because Mao Zedong has, uh, you know, does not express any great support for the Soviet policy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hmm. In fact, when the Soviet Union pulls out of, or whatever, you know, decides to withdraw the missiles from Cuba, Mao Zedong says that this is the worst of all worlds. You know, you start with adventurism and you end with capitulation, right? So he mm. says you did both wrong. You should never have gone in and you should never have gone in the way. Right. So the Sino-Soviet relationship, and funnily enough, at that point of time, 
when Khrushchev wants to once again reorient policies, one of the first things that he tells Indian ambassador to Moscow, TN Call, is that we will deliver the mix. Don't worry. <laughs> right? So the mix are quite important in that yeah, sense. Important. But you said that, that, the, that Russia, because of the Cuban crisis, needed China at that point of time. But on the day when, when Khrushchev told the Chinese ambassador who was leaving Moscow, on that day, Russia did not know that America is going to discover uh, the missiles because they had the plan of declaring it about two weeks from then. No, no, absolutely. So, you're, so, you're right. I mean, there is no, uh, as I said, Khrushchev's response to that kind of a trial balloon that the Chinese were floating but very, yeah. was principally given as an expression of ideological solidarity, of a desire to mend fences with the Chinese and so on. Now, whether he believed that, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis is going to happen or some confrontation with America was on the cards is something that we cannot know. Nobody, hmm. you know, that, that's not possible <clears throat> to discern. But certainly, uh, so I think one of the things that Nehru actually got wrong in the sort of dealing with China and the China-Soviet Union relationship and is he significantly underestimated the importance of the ideological dimension of the foreign policy of these countries. You know, even with China, he consistently overemphasized the nationalism of Chinese policy. Uh, same with the Soviet Union, hmm. right? Uh, again, you know, it, it is a case that the Soviet Union and Chinese fell out. They actually ended up fighting each other in 1969. Hmm. Uh, you know, that actually worked towards cementing India-Soviet relations in, in another very crucial time in 1971. Yes. But, hmm. uh, but that is far in the future, right? So, so in a sense, uh, it, it was a miscalculation born out of an underestimation of certain very important aspects of international politics like ideology. Now, when we were trying to draw closer to the Soviet Union, and then and the Americans also stepped in with the support, uh, Pakistan was looking at all this with extreme uh, sense of alarm. And '63, they concluded a treaty with, with China. Uh, now, I want to you know go back a little bit in in time, and you know to to, to the time in 1950s when Pakistan and America relationship is cemented, and you spent considerable time on on how the you know, historical biases have shaped American policy in, in South Asia, and you specifically mention that the the British notion, the colonial notion of martial races. Uh, and 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 uh, northwestern Muslims being a particularly you, you know you know high up in this hierarchy, uh, it made them it made some of the American policymakers feel that Pakistan would be a more dependable ally in the fight against you know, communism, particularly because it is on the frontier as well. Uh, now now uh, so and and at different points of time in your, in your book. You emphasize the historical linkages with the pre 20th century American engagement with South Asia and how those biases affected affected, affected its, its foreign policy. But I would like to know from you is is that is that such a is such a misleading stereotype, right? Can that can that explain American engagement in in you know uh, American partnership with with Pakistan? Because soon after that, they are saying that it just we don't really know why we have entered into this, and then they continue for the next 60, 70 years, 60 years. So I'd like to know you know how far do stereotypes play a role in determining international uh, alliances and and and. Yeah, no, this is an interesting case, right? Because, uh, I mean, I wouldn't maybe put it as necessarily a stereotype. I mean, there was an element of stereotyping, definitely. But I think there were um, cultural lenses which were framing the way that the Americans saw this part of the world, right? Uh, Hindus and Muslims, subsequently, it came to be cast as India and Pakistan, right? Mm. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, the Now, again, I, I'm not... I wouldn't like to sort of, you know, extrapolate from this one instance and say that, you know, these things are always kind of very important. I think it depends from context to context. But in this specific context, I think it is definitely it was important for two reasons. One is that, see, the United States is a country which comes to acquire extraordinary preponderant position in global affairs after the Second World War, right? Uh, because it's, uh, they are the country which emerges strongest in every way from that particular conflict. But they are also a country which has had very little dealings with the rest of the world. I mean, isolationism mm. was a very strong strain in American foreign policy. Uh, to the extent that there were contacts with countries like India, it was principally around missionaries, trade, 
and other kinds of things, many of which tended to sort of reinforce these kinds of stereotyping. Right? So hardly any political contacts. I mean, the, the, those contacts began with Gandhi and the Indian nationalist movement to some degree, but there was no deep understanding. The second thing is that, you know, after the Korean War, you know, start, begins in 1950, under, especially under the, in the Eisenhower administration, there is a sense that we have to cultivate a set of allies in Asia, right? Because there is NATO in the context of Europe, but there's never a NATO in the context of Asia, mm -hmm. partly because, uh, you know, you cannot get countries like Japan and South Korea on the same side. I mean, South Korea looks at Japan even today with a degree of sort of, you know, distrust and suspicion and so on. So uh, they try to create this hub and spoke model of alliances, United States being the hub, and you have spokes which are there. So a series of alliances are being crafted in very quick order. And an, an entity called CATO is trying to be put up, they try to put up CENTO. Cento. So in this pell-mell drive to acquire allies, they decide that we need Pakistan because Pakistan can be important in the context of the Middle East. You know, they are right there next to Afghanistan. They can do various kinds of things. And these various kinds of, you know, uh, when you don't understand something very well or some part of the world very well, you reach for shortcuts, right? We all do. The human brain and, you know, our knowledge systems work like that. Heuristics are, you know, you go for the shortest sort of. And then the, the shortcuts that they held on were things that, you know, Americans had read from Kipling, various other kinds of British authors which I try to bring out in the book, to say that, you know, those kinds of cultural uh, perceptions in some ways were in the driver's seat. I mean, someone like John Foster Dulles, uh, and I quote this, I think, in the book, tells uh, an American sort of journalist who asks him, saying, why are you going and signing up an alliance with Pakistan? I think that they have the Gurkhas, the Gurkhas want to fight. I mean, he says, what are you talking about here, right? So that is the level of, uh, how do you put it, uh, general lack of understanding and ignorance. And as you say, uh, President Eisenhower comes to review the sort of thing because it sours the relationship with India, which mm. he understands is an important country even if it doesn't want to be an allied country. And that we are not actually getting anything out of uh, this <laughs> alliance with Pakistan, right? Because Pakistan is not fighting any war on behalf of the United States. So it turns out to be one of those things where, which is there. But in international relations as in economics, you know, sunk costs matter a lot. Yeah. Once you decide that you have invested, once you have created an entire, you know, set of reasons and rationales for saying why we are doing something. Very difficult then to peel back unless you have people who are willing to sort of absorb costs to, uh, you know, uh, to a very considerable degree, right? I mean, I mean, to take a parallel, right? I mean, if, if you look at, say, the amount of investment that the United States has done in propping up Ukraine in, in the conflict against Russia, even tomorrow, let's assume there is a president who actually wants to pull back. That president easy. will have to, you know, really sort of have to deal with a range of institutional pressures before they can actually accomplish something like that. So I think, that kept the story going. And of course, as I, you know, say in the book later, you know, there is a second wind to the U.S.-Pakistan relationship after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1969. Mm. Again, based on entirely sort of completely wrong, romantic and nonsensical notions about who the Mujahideen were. In fact, if you go on yeah. YouTube and I'd say all our viewers should take a look at some of those videos. There are videos of Mujahideen leaders being welcomed by President Ronald Reagan in the lawns of the White House saying that these are people who are fighting on behalf of the free world. I mean, <laughs> so uh, again, with everything that we know since then, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but that was what was explained. And it was on that basis that Pakistan's, you know, the Reagan administration blatantly issued false uh, sort of certification to the Congress saying that the Pakistanis are not pursuing nuclear weapons and so on. Now, again, you know, they may have done it out of their own thing, but all I'm trying to say is that the decision, even if it was taken on extremely sort of limited sort of and false grounds, tends to have long consequences, as you say. When we think of India's international strategic calculus, uh, we have a we have an we have a very pronounced Western bias in terms of we look at Pakistan side. You know, side. Now, uh, we are we often completely ignore the Eastern side, Eastern theater. Uh, and and that I perhaps see in your book as well because you have a you know you, you book on America's impact on South Asia relationship, you focus entirely on the Western Kashmir and Western side, but you do not even when you talk about the Second World War and because a lot of American soldiers were posted in Nepal, Dimapur, in those areas, but you don't really engage with that aspect. And so, is it you know is there is there a is there a and, 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 and I see this to be a um, I see this to be a major problem in our international. Uh, thought that uh, we somehow dealing the two, East and West. But if you see the history, they are so closely related. So the, so the problems that we faced in Northeastern Frontier Agency 
are more or less the same problems which Pakistan faces in northwest frontier uh, hmm. province, right? Uh, the the problems, uh, the problems that we face in Kashmir, they have a close parallel to the problems which we face in Nagaland. In fact, often developments take in the in these two states almost at the same time. 1953, Jawaharlal Nehru visited Kohima with UNU, and he was, you know, uh, the crowd boycotted. boycotted him. A few months later, Sheikh Abdullah says that I am seeing a different Nehru. He's a, he's a changed Nehru, right? And 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 so there are 1975. We have a uh, agreement in. In Hagaland, we have an agreement in Kashmir, right? Late 1990s, the the, the Bajpay government's dealing with the Sheikh Park Abdullah government in Kashmir and the Congress government in Kohima are more or less similar. And both chief ministers have almost identical complaints. So my, so my question to you is that, and because you engage with the foreign affairs and, and defense policies and you've been someone who has worked in the armed forces as well, uh, you know, uh, am, I, am, I, am I right in saying that there's a, that there's a, a marked, you know, um, thinking on the eastern front and the western front and that has implications for how, you know, how we, you know, look at our problems with China or others. No, I think you're absolutely right, and it's, it's actually quite an important point that you raise. Um, now, you know, with respect to that particular book, um, I would say that the United States was, say, its uh, interest in the Kashmir issue, etc., was much greater than the interest in the Nagaland sort of problem, right? I mean, the, to the extent that there was any American, you know, interest in the Nagaland question, it was only because of the presence of various kinds of Baptist kind of missions and other things there, right? I mean, they didn't take that much more of an interest. But your broader point is well taken, which is that um, even within the domain of international relations, studies of Indian foreign policy, um, you know, why is it that the East, uh, you know, and, and you know, even in the kind of historical accounts that we have is not. Um, and uh, all I can say is that, you know, that there is a new generation of scholars who have been doing some excellent new work on the East and, uh, you know, um, and uh, I, I, for instance, uh, think of there is a new forthcoming book uh, by a young scholar called Avinash Paliwal, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a book which is called in India's Near East, where he tries to link <coughs> the sort of way in which India dealt with the insurgencies in the northeast, uh, sort of uh, northeastern states, with the relationships with Bangladesh, with Myanmar, and with China as well. And that's exactly the kind of perspective that you are identifying as absent. And I'm happy to say that, you know, there are people who are now taking mm -hmm. it up. And I really hope that, you know, that, you know, we, we need to. And even within the Northeast, right? I mean, I think there are uh, some areas, some problems are better covered than others. Uh, and I think, you know, we definitely need to bring in a comparative perspective between Jammu and Kashmir and the Nagaland mm -hmm. and uh, others, Assam perhaps. Um, you know, both to sort of illuminate and, you know, show what differences are, right? And then how the Indian state has dealt with things in uh, somewhat different ways, uh, so to speak. So I think I think that is a uh, important thing, even though, you know, a state like Nagaland, for instance, gets statehood much later than Jammu and Kashmir. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jammu and Kashmir already comes to India as a state, a <coughs> state and so on. So even though the starting points are different, um, you know, the, the histories are, I think, interesting. And there are, I think, good comparative connected histories to be written of um, the Indian states kind of dealing with, you know, both of these kinds of um, you know, more challenging sort of uh, states within the union. Uh, I'd now like to come to the more recent period. So 2008 is when the India, the Indian government decides finally and there's a, in the, to, to sign the nuclear cooperation agreement with America. In 2008, in the same year, there was a major terrorist attack in Bombay. It was a, it was a culmination of series of uh, Attacks across India in the, in the in the past three or four years. Now, in that attack, uh, that was the first televised terrorist attack, hmm. to, so to say. And uh, it seems that people uh, were were so they were familiar with. Uh, I mean, they were accustomed. They had become accustomed to attacks, but they were sort of taken aback by the helplessness of the armed forces, which took three days to battle the, the the terrorists now um, 
in, in such situation, it does take time. But the fact that all this was unfolding on television for the first time, you know, had an impact on people. Now, uh, to me, it seems that, uh, that the government of India, by deciding not to target Pakistan at that time, um, may have contributed to the growth of uh, the right of this center in the in the Indian politics. Now, the decision not to attack was justified because you know we are we had just you know signed the nuclear agreement, and the last thing you wanted to is to do is to start a shooting match with a nuclear nuclear neighbor, and more importantly. The, the global financial crisis had just kicked in and people at the top would have known that this is going to be bad and we need to focus on this. So I think from the global political economic perspective that the government made the correct choices, but it perhaps failed to con con communicate this to the people, you know, who are going to, you know, essentially be your, be your judge at the, at the end of five years. Uh, uh, so it seems that the frustration at, at at the, at the non-response at that time did contribute to the turn towards the right. Now, you have, you know, looked at wars over the last 50, 60 years and you have studied, you know, the, the international politics and domestic aspects as well. I, I'd like to know from you how big was that a contributor to the uh, emergence of the right of center after that? Right. I mean, maybe, you know, one way <coughs> of thinking about this question could be to say that you know these kinds of decisions of when to use force, um, what kind of force to use, whether you want to escalate, what will be the consequences of those things. Those are very contextual decisions <coughs> which are made, right? And every context has it. I mean, to go back to 1962, there is even now uh, uh, something of a debate amongst the strategic community, particularly people who are interested in air power, about why India did not use the Indian Air Force during the 1962 war. We had a bit of an edge, or at least that's what the air power people claim. There are arguments saying the American ambassador, John Kenneth Galbraith, actually was an economist, actually sort of, you know, prevailed upon Jawaharlal Nehru not to do that because it will lead to further escalation and so on. Um, if you look at the context of 1971, right, I mean, there was a lot of hue and cry in May 1971 saying that India should immediately send an army into Pakistan and, you know, deal with the problem. And frankly, if we had managed to do that, perhaps, you know, fewer people would have been killed and displaced in the context. But the government of the time took its own sort of decision that, you know, that's not a viable course for us to follow, so we will take a more measured view. Uh, fast forward to 1999, um, the Kargil War, uh, which again I've had a bit of an occasion to study because I wrote the official history of the government of India. And uh, what is very clear is that from the very beginning, the Vajpayee government took a clear view that they will not cross the line of control. But that was presented as a political choice. Yes. It was presented that we are a country which wants to emphasize that it is Pakistan which has violated the line of control, which should have a sanctity because it comes out of an agreed international <coughs> agreement between the two countries, right? So, and they presented it that way. Yes. And as you rightly say, with 2008, what was not so much problematic or questionable is perhaps the assumptions which they had. You know, they had, as you say, a range of good reasons for why it should not have been done. And, uh, you know, frankly, I remember at that point of time thinking that that was perhaps the right thing to do. Yes. Uh, I mean, that was my contemporary sort of thing. But, as you rightly say, where perhaps the government of the day fails to understand is that at the end of the day, these things also have to be presented as political sort of decisions. And um, they clearly underestimated the extent to which, uh, you know, public opinion was kind of aroused by this particular issue, though they did use other things. I mean, it's not the government did not do anything, and they did it at home. Like, for instance, all kinds of new anti-terror laws were passed by mm. Mr. Chidambaram uh, once he took over as Home Minister, right? With consequences playing out no. <laughs> in, far into the future. So, uh, but uh, they did not, and that became a sore point. Uh, and I think, you know, that was also a decade when coming after 9-11, the issue of terrorism was something that was already sort of in the minds of people. And as you yes. say, there were a string of attacks. This was a very large one. It had a psychological impact of a certain kind. Um, you know, it is also worth wondering whether, you know, what the government did in 2019 hmm. uh, could not have been done in 2008, which is to say that you do a very calibrated kind of a strike and make sure that, you know, there is no further escalation. And my own sense is perhaps they were more concerned about the possibility of escalation if, uh, to the extent that these things might have been discussed. We don't know. Hopefully hmm. in the future, some documents will be available. We'll be able to understand what their thinking was. But clearly, I think there was a greater concern about escalation, right? Whereas nowadays, I think, you know, not just in India, but even if you look at countries like Israel and Iran, 
you know, there is a sense that you have to retaliate for your own public opinion, but you make it clear to the other side that you're only doing it because you have to do it. That kind of a political uh, thinking was clearly absent in the context of 2008. It definitely allowed um, the BJP to present the UPA2 government as weak on terrorism. And as you say, that perhaps, at least in as much as I don't know how much this particular issue had, because there were a range of issues which were weakening uh, the UPA2's sort of prospects uh, in 2014. Um, but definitely, you know, that was something that, uh, you know, the BJP was able to uh, come up strongly. And 2019, we know that the Balakot strikes definitely allowed them to claim that, you know, they were much more vigilant in terms of securing India and capable of striking back. Uh, even an interesting thing, right? I mean, the, the Pakistani counter strike the next day was at least as whatever, you know, <laughs> as much an indication. And the Pakistanis did it in broad daylight, right? After giving an intimation saying that we're going to do it, they still carried it out. Uh, and we actually happened to take losses on our own side because of blue on blue firing. In fact, that report was not allowed to come out yes. during the election and so on. So the management, political management of these things is quite important. And I think that's a very good point to take away from this episode. One more thing about, about I'd like to go back to 1971, um, <clears throat> 1960s and early 70s. Uh, America had at various point of time, you know, I I imposed sanction embargo on delivery of arms to Pakistan. Now, when it found in a, itself in a situation where Pakistan needs needs arms, and in, but it cannot directly supply, so it would then lean on friendly powers to do that. Now, it it so appears that at different points of time, it did lean on. E e e Iran, Saudi Arabia and other countries, it's interesting that these countries on their own did not offer the arms. It is American, you know, leaning on them which, which worked. Now, uh, and the fact, now, now this is interesting because uh, now if you go to late 70s, early 80s, when, uh, when American foreign policy, you know, leadership decided that they have to arm the Mujahideen to out, you know, the Soviets, it seems that this idea of uh, Pakistan has this notion that it is part of a global family of Muslim countries and they ought to come to each other's, you know, help. Am I wrong that the foreign policy choices of America also cultivated this, uh, this way of thinking in Pakistan? Because, uh, you know, no other country actually came on its own, you know, if I'm not wrong. No, I think uh, you're right. I mean, in the context of the 1971 war particularly, the Nixon administration tried to get other uh, countries, Jordan, Iran, yeah. etc., <clears throat> which held American uh, weapons in their inventory to say that we will supply you and that you can do it. Pas partly because at home, the US Congress would not allow them to kind of do those kinds of activities and so on. So that definitely was there. And uh, the United States, uh, you know, definitely encouraged Pakistan uh, to you know, play a very active role in supporting the Mujahideen in the context of Afghanistan. Though the, the, the Pakistan government, even before that, even under Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, for a variety yeah. of reasons, was trying to pressure Afghanistan and, uh, on its own and so on. So, yes, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, the United States um, definitely has played a very important role in uh, propping up Pakistan as a sort of an actor which has undertaken what can only be said as a series of misadventures in the context of South Asia, right? I mean, whether it's 1947, 1965, uh, 1971, of course, uh, was an internal issue for them, but the manner in which they dealt with it without any consequences uh, from the United States, which could, you know, which could easily have done things even short of, you know, alienating the Pakistanis. Um, uh, and then, you know, through the Reagan period, uh, which I think was actually, in some ways, you know, it's, it's a period that we are only now getting to understand. And, you know, the histories are only now being written up. Documents are only now getting available. But it's it's extraordinary the extent to which the Reagan administration was willing to uh, to effectively deceive its own sort of lawmaking apparatus in the Congress in order to, you know, make sure that the Pakistanis are continuing to support the Mujahideen uh, and so on, right? I mean, so so I think that is has been a very important kind of a role uh, which the Americans have played. Uh, the Pakistanis, of course, think of it uh, in a somewhat different way. They say that the Americans have used us whenever they wanted and then discarded us from time to time. But, uh, you know, Pakistan's geographic location and its geopolitical uh, importance has always come handy one way or the other. Uh, I don't know what the future holds for the US-Pakistan relationship. Right now it is in one of those 
troughs at this point of <laughs> yes. time. We will have to wait and see what is going to bail this relationship out, if anything. So, right. present Pakistan and Afghanistan are at loggerheads with each other. Pakistan had invested in Afghanistan, so to say, uh, you know, believing that this time they will they finally have friendly government. But now it is gone. It seems that the calculus didn't work out well. So, but you know, you've seen these. 80s, 90s, based on that period, what do you feel is the, is the future of the uh, Afghanistan-Pakistan relation at the moment? You're right. I mean, um, the Pakistanis uh, cultivated the Taliban government both when it was in power earlier, then when it was uh, more or less ousted from Afghanistan after 2001, uh, and then helped them sort of regroup and come back to power. But uh, things have not worked out as smoothly as the Pakistan government uh, perhaps would have liked it to, the Pakistan army and the intelligence services uh, which dealt with the Afghanistan. But I think it's worth remembering that if you take a longer historical view, the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan was always troubled. You know, uh, Afghanistan was one of the, we don't recall this now, but one of the few countries that actually vetoed the entry of Pakistan into the United Nations in 1947. Uh, because uh, there was a very strong movement in Afghanistan uh, which believed that Pakistan and the Durand line which separates Afghanistan and Pakistan was an artificial imperial creation which separated the Pashtun people on either side. Uh, and you know, one of the main leaders of the Pashtunistan kind of movement was you know, Abdul Ghaffar Khan whom the Pakistanis then imprisoned for uh, several years. Uh, and so there was a very strong feeling that in a sense, uh, you know, the Pakistan kind of, uh, both the existence of Pakistan and the continuation of this problem of Pashtun nationalism uh, would be a tricky sort of issue. And, and then, of course, the, you know, communist face in Afghanistan's history, etc., only exacerbated it. So, uh, as I see it, I mean, at this point of time, you know, Afghanistan's, uh, you know, lack of any external kind of recognition, etc., is perhaps the main sort of obstacle that the Taliban government has to overcome. And perhaps there, Pakistan may still have some role to play. So I wouldn't sort of say that, you know, it's time to sort of say that, oh, you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan are falling out. I mean, they do have some friction. They do have, uh, you know, clearly it, it has not been as smooth sailing as perhaps the Pakistanis would have assumed. But I think Afghanistan also needs Pakistan. I, and I think we should be wary of underestimating the isolation of the Taliban government and its need for support. I mean, there are only a few countries which even recognize the Taliban government when they were in sub power previously, yeah. right? I mean, Saudi yes. Arabia was one, Pakistan was another, UAE, yeah. I think, was the third. We were the third country. Yeah, so I think there were three countries which had recognized them. Um, then, of course, you know, Pakistan might be a conduit for improvement of relations uh, with other countries like China, etc. So I would say that, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, you know, we have done, if you look at it historically, is that uh, is the sheer resilience of Pakistan as a geopolitical actor. You know, yes. which is actually quite important and it's quite impressive. Uh, even impressive And I actually. say this in a positive sense that from their perspective, I mean, if you look at Pakistani diplomats, the way that they have batted on a very weak wicket on certain <laughs> issues and still managed to keep them afloat for so long and engage the energies of a bigger country like India, which is much bigger than them, is actually quite impressive on its own terms for what, you know, that country has managed to do, uh, to do this. Thing. Now, obviously, right now they are in a very difficult time of their history and you know, we don't know how things will play out. But all I would say is that, you know, uh, that's a country with, whose geopolitical sort of resilience in some ways, you know, ability to sort of bounce back, you know, resilience in the sort of very technical sort of mm -hmm. sense, uh, I think should not be underestimated. Uh, so all I'd say is that, you know, it, there is an interesting sort of story still to unfold, I think, of the relationship between Afghanistan, Pakistan and of this entire sort of region as a whole. So. Thanks a lot, Hina, for this conversation. And we'll conclude with this. No, thank you so much, Vikas. Uh, very insightful questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.